Joining us tonight to talk about your health is Dr. Wallace Johnson, an internal medicine physician and hypertension specialist at the University of Maryland Medical Center and an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Doctor, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Jeff, for inviting me. Why is it so important for adults, especially older adults, to, to know about their blood pressure and, and have it under control? Well, the first thing I like to do is always talk just a little bit about why the numbers are so large. Because some people say, well, you just made that quote, which I love. It's like one half of American adults are going to have hypertension or be affected by hypertension in some way. And what, one of the reasons is that not too long ago, 2017, when we um, actually I helped review uh, some hypertension guidelines, as we were looking at those, they lowered the number. We used to think about 140 over 90 all the time. Now we think more about 130 over 80 over less more often. So therefore, it made the number number of quote-unquote hypertensive patients grow. That's now, called moving the goalposts, right? I mean, you had people yeah. who were happy at 140 or something. Right, right. And, but there was a reason for the change. Now, yes, exactly. There was a study that came out where they've actually found that people who could get their blood pressure to lower numbers, more like 130 over 80, did better than the people who averaged around 140 over 90. So as a result, they said, well, we have to think about what we're going to do to reduce, because it's all about reducing cardio cardiovascular risk and reducing cardiovascular events. And that's really what it's all about. So that's why adults, especially as we get to be older, need to understand the importance of hitting your number, knowing your goal, and knowing where your goal is and hitting your goal. We'll, we'll talk about the, the treatment options you, you have. Sure. But for, for somebody who does not yet have this problem, maybe they're younger, they're, they're sure. in great shape, mm -hmm. what, what do you do to, to ensure that as you get older, mm -hmm. you don't develop high blood pressure? Okay, well, always the things that you probably have heard, a lot of people have heard already between diet and exercise. Now, when it comes to exercise, of course, we tell people naturally that you don't want to go out and become a weekend warrior in 15 days. You want to go out and you want to ask your physician and say, I'm thinking about doing a hypertension prevention initiative, if you want to call it that, for yourself. And you can say to yourself at that particular point in time, a good question to ask your physician is, well, do I need a stress test? I'm about to do a vigorous you know, exercise program. Do I need a stress test? Because that's one of the things I want to do to try to help prevent my high blood pressure from rising. I'm going to try to exercise you know, somewhat vigorously and try to get my 150 minutes a week or more when I do my exercises. And then the second thing you want to ask your physician about if you're going to make a change in your diet, what kind of dietary changes might have a little bit of a more realistic way, because the physician's going to hopefully know some personal things about you, a little bit more realistic about maintaining, because everybody has a fair diet, right, that they can do for three to six months, and it works wonderful. The question I have is after that six to 12 months, what happens? And that's always the challenge. That's the toughest part. You, you don't have a magic bullet for that, do you? Exactly. There's no magic bullet. If I did, I'd use probably on myself a couple of times, too, because sometimes <laughs> it's tough for the physicians as well to go and try to do these things for a long period of time. But again, it's about a lifestyle change, not a fad. What, what about medical treatment of, of hypertension? So you have the lifestyle side of it, right. uh, but you also have pills. And, right. and some people are happy to pop mm -hmm. a pill yes. as, as opposed to doing that, what was it, 150 minutes a week? Exactly, 150 yeah. minutes a week, right. So ha has there been any change in, in medical therapy? Oh, yes, there is. I mean, of course, right now, there's a lot of research going on on different pathways. Because remember, when we're talking about high blood pressure. It has to get high based on a certain mechanism. Sometimes the mechanism may be the body doesn't handle salt appropriately. Sometimes the mechanism may be there's vasoconstriction or the blood vessels squeeze down, and so therefore the blood pressures are not surprising, it goes up. Or sometimes people hear the word hypertension, and you can think about the sympathetic nervous system being hyper or being super sensitive, so things can make the blood pressure go up. And of course, we think about what white coat hypertension, where people might have an even more sensitive sympathetic nervous system. I, I confess to that in in the green room when yes. when we were talking because I bought one of these machines mm -hmm. and it's great at home. My blood pressure is perfect. 
Right. Be delighted to share the readings with anybody. Uh -huh. but, but I walk into your office or, or the right. office of somebody wearing a white coat and it goes up 10 points. Sure, sure. And that's one of the reasons why people can really resonate with the term hypertension, right? Because they'll say, oh, people who have hypertension may be a little bit more hyper. But the truth of the matter is, of course, you can be perfectly calm and still have hypertension. But the reality of the situation is some people probably do have overactive sympathetic nervous systems and therefore they may be more predisposed to having some higher or increases in blood pressure during the white coat syndrome, if you will. Let me uh, remind our viewers, if you have a question about high blood pressure, anything else for Men's Health Month, give us a call at the number on the screen, or you can send an email to livequestions at mpt.org. So this is Men's Health Month. Yes. What else do you want men to be thinking about? Well, I guess one of the other things we want men to be thinking about as they're moving forward is also think about the two big ones, I, and I use a uh, little phrase in my practice, I kind of call it CIC, and people say, well, what CIC means? You think about the three big things that happen to people that have, I guess what you want to call potentially preventable causes of death, cancer, infectious diseases, and cardiovascular diseases. When you think about it, when you get those big three involved, that represents an overwhelming majority of the deaths in the United States of America. So what men have to think about in addition to cardiovascular disease, they also need to think about cancer as well. So I tell people to think about the sort of head to toe evaluation. You think about the fact that skin cancer, one of the things you have to be careful with skin is you have to do what? Protect yourself from the sun. What's one of the parts of your body that gets most exposed to the sun? Your face, neck, places where, you know, if you don't wear a hat, you're going to get over sun exposed, right? So think about skin cancer. Go a little bit further down, what do you hit? The lungs. We've got to think about lung cancer. So for both hypertension reasons and cardiovascular reasons, if you're a smoker, you want to do everything possible to stop smoking. And then also when you think about the lungs, you want to think about were you in your younger years or maybe even now, do you have something in your home or at your workplace which is considered a lung toxin? If it is, a lot of asbestosis, of course, we know a lot about in Maryland. And as we think it is, then we want to think about how we're going to reduce our exposure to that. Both cigarette smoke, whether it be firsthand or secondhand cigarette smoke. Now, there's even the one thing now people talk about now, which is called third-hand cigarette smoke. Probably a lot of people haven't heard of it. Yeah. And that's a situation where if somebody's smoking frequently in a home and cigarette smoke is getting on, for example, child's toys, then maybe by them touching the toys and then putting their hands in their mouth, they're getting exposed to toxins that way, something we didn't think about before. But there's such a thing now we talk about third-hand smoke. So when I try to get people to get motivated and not smoking, one of the good things I can say to a lot of the members of this audience, if you've got grandchildren who play in your house a lot and you smoke a lot inside your house, maybe you're exposing them to third-hand smoke, even if they come in after you finish smoking. That's another thing to keep in mind. I, I know you're also interested in, in mental health and sure. the, the context of, of overall health. And mm -hmm. in the amount of time that, that uh, doctors and patients typically have together these days. How, how do you bring that up? Well, what I first of all bring it up in the way of just saying that now, of course, our jobs are a lot easier than it was when I first started doing this many years ago. We now have more and more moving away from the stigma of mental health. We see like what Michael Phelps now doing commercials on yeah. mental health. That's something I don't think would have happened for an Olympian 25 years ago. So when I bring it up in my conversation, I say to yourself, is there anything that makes you feel so stressed that you feel like it really affects your functioning, you feel like it really affects, you know, how you relate to others? And that's a way of kind of in a non-threatening sort of way, you know, bringing something up. Because let's face it, for men, when we think about mental health and we think about what, we want to be what? Stoic, because stoic is strong, right? You know, getting me emotional, that's Absolutely. too much like non-male. But stoic, strong, you know, and think about the stigma that's associated with it, too. Um, and Terry Bradshaw was a good example of that. Terry Bradshaw said, hey, you know, I was talking about mental health, and everybody went crazy, literally, when they was talking about mental health. But he said men came on TV who were his fellow football players and talked about things like adultery and things of that nature. People said, oh, okay. But you start talking about mental health, and Terry Bradshaw said, hey, I got a totally different reaction than some of my other colleagues who had done some things which I thought were kind of interesting things to do or things that I wouldn't want to be caught doing. But I got a different reaction when I started talking about mental health. 
So I think the short answer to the answer question is that the way I bring it up in my office practice is talking about something that can be a tendency or something that can be a thought process that can interfere with your interactions with others or you think might hinder the way you interact at the workplace and your home place in some way. A um, couple of viewer questions. Um, is there such thing as a healthy, low blood pressure? What would that number be? Now, there, there's a point where it can be too low. Sure. sure I, I think sure. the viewer is asking about right. maybe how low is too low or, right. or what would be okay with you? Sure, sure. What we generally tell people, because you have to remember now, you have to maintain a certain blood pressure to perfuse the organs because one of the things that high blood pressure does is it can bring destruction to the blood vessels over time and that minimizes flow of blood to the organs. So say for example when you think about the kidney, we'll often will talk about the fact that with the kidney we talk about well let's try to maintain a blood pressure of at least 110 for the top number because remember now in a lot of older adults the top number will tend to increase out of proportion to how much the bottom number, the so-called diastolic blood pressure increases, the systolic okay. will tend to raise higher. So I generally tell people 110 is kind of a nice cushion to shoot for because we tell people less than 130 over 80 and some people think, well, does that mean 98 is okay? I generally tell people, no, I don't try to shoot for 98. I don't try to shoot for 102. I try to say 110 or a little higher, somewhere in that sweet spot, 110, 120, 122, and that ballpark is a better, a better way to think of it. Um, can you explain the reason why your thyroid would prevent you from losing weight? Well, the thyroid, remember, is involved with uh, aspects of metabolism because you have two people, we always talk about two people eat the same food. You know, one guy goes to the ball game and eats four hot dogs, and you see him next week and he hasn't gained a pound. Another guy goes to the ball game and looks at half of a hot dog, and it seems like, you know, he can't fit out the door of the ballpark. I think I'm that guy, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, but what happens is when you have, for example, an underactive thyroid, you tend to not metabolize as quickly, or what your metabolism will be slower. Meta meta I should say metabolism will be slower and as a result of that, you have a tendency to do what? Gain weight. And you have a tendency when you, for example, have hyper or overactive thyroid, the metabolism goes in the opposite direction. So somebody may abnormally lose weight, you know. Let, let's talk a little bit uh, about health disparities, which sure. I know is an interest of yours. So there, mm -hmm. there's conditions that affect African Americans disproportionately. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then within the black community, there are also access to care issues. Sure. It can be, you know, a double whammy. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Well, let's just talk about the definition first. When you start talking about health disparities, you're talking about preventable differences which have an impact on different socially disadvantaged populations. And African Americans is one example, but also now we know there's a thing called Dr. Deserts that people are talking about sure. now. So now in rural communities now where physicians have moved out or gotten older, maybe retired, they have places where you have to drive 50 plus miles to see any kind of physician in parts of the United States. So as a result, that can bring about what? A health disparity, that's what? An access disparity. But even within cities like, um, you know, Baltimore, Chicago, New York, whatever it may be, there are other access issues that come up. For example, if somebody doesn't have access because there's a small number of physicians practicing in their community, then they do what? Use the emergency room as their access point for care. And we know what happens to an emergency room when it gets busy. We saw that during COVID, and we found that people were what actually have. We heard all the hard stories, people passing away while waiting in the emergency room. Doctor, we gotta leave it there. You're taking new patients? Yes, I am. Dr. Wallace Johnson, University of Maryland Medical Center. Appreciate your time. Thank you uh, very thank much. Thank you so much. Your health segments are a co-production of Maryland Public Television and the University of Maryland Medical System.